Hey, my name is Shelley Reed. I am the manager of the Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, and we're excited today to have Ellie Mattern here with us to talk to us about BYOD, Bring Your Own Device Policies, and all the things that go along with it. So I'm going to turn the um, program over to Ellie and sit back and let's listen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellie, as Shelly mentioned, and I was going to tell you all to feel free and keep your cameras off, but you beat me to it. So no problem on that. I, I do like to take questions as I go. So if you have any questions, please feel free to come on off mute and ask your question out loud. Uh, that would be helpful for the recording. And if not, if you're shy, that's totally okay too. Please feel free to drop it in the chat and I will read it out loud, you know, to the best of my ability. Shelly, you can still see my screen, right? That's correct. Okay. So as Shelly mentioned, uh, I'm Ellie Matter and I am the, I don't know if I introduced myself, I'm the Director of Technology for Community Legal Services in Mid-Florida. We're an LLC funded program, as I assume many of you are, and if not, I welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be here. So a little bit uh, a, a few definitions at first. So what does BYOD mean? Uh, it's a bring your own device policy. Some of your organizations may have them or may be considering them. Part of the reason Shelly and I decided to put this presentation together is that Community Legal Services was considering putting in place a BYOD policy. And I knew that I wanted to do some research on it at any way this year. And so it was a great opportunity for me to share with the community the things that I had learned and bring them back. So a BYOD policy defines the circumstances under which employees can use their personal devices for work purposes. Uh, devices can include laptops, smartphones, tablets, and other devices. I include those other devices because while most of the time people are talking about phones and computers, I also have recently imagined the idea of a VR headset that was someone's personal device that they're meeting uh, other employees in VR land to talk about compute uh, employee related issues. So it really could be any device that an employee owns. I, before we get too far into it, I do want to just, you know, take a little pause on this road and talk about to policy or not to policy. So I think that it is incumbent on anyone who is a director or an organizational member to think about, does our organization need a policy for this? Uh, there can be a an operational default to say like, yes, let's put a policy in place, but that's not always the best option. And so our detour, because this is, a, this is the hill I will die on, is do we need a policy for this? So let's talk about reasons to policy and reasons not to policy. So reasons to policy can be compliance issues. Some of you are probably LSC funded. LSC has a lot of compliance requirements. We have legal requirements as law firms. Funders have various requirements where we need to collect certain data. There, those are all great reasons to have policies around things. They're great reasons largely because of the next two points, because you can instill managerial consistency. That means when a case is closed, it is always closed with one of these few place, case closure codes. Uh, if, thank you, Shelley. Yeah, LSC, Legal Services Corporation. Uh, if you have multiple units within your organization, so if you've got a housing unit and a family law unit, to make sure that they are closing cases the same way, to make sure they are uh, doing the same things with their cases. So management consistency across the organization is one reason to have a policy. And then it also can be helpful for your employees. It sets clear expectations. If you have a policy around answering the phone that says, Hi, welcome to Community Legal Services of Mid-Florida. We're happy to assist you. That means that every time somebody answers the phone, they're going to answer it the same way. That makes it very uh, normative for an employee to know what is expected of them and then how do they go above and beyond that to be like an extra stellar awesome employee or how do they fall below that in a way that may impact their performance review. So those are all great reasons to put a policy in place for a variety of things reasons not to policy. So uh, employee morale. I have heard from many employees that too many policies can stifle their 
a forward momentum on a project, if they feel like they always have to go and look something up, if they just want to get out there and do the work and hit the ground running, but then they feel like they have to wade through a myriad of policies, uh, that can be really damaging to employee morale. And so you want to be mindful of not uh, putting someone in a place where they feel like you're putting barriers to them doing the work that they want to do, to doing the work of the firm that the organization is made for. Management of policies. So as an admin and as one of the people who has to manage these policies, if you have 7,000 policies, that means you have to keep track of 7,000 policies. And keeping track means, has everybody been trained on the policy? When was the last time it was updated? And then constantly recycling through, do we need to update this policy? Is it antiquated? Is it useful? So management of policies is really its own chore that an organization should be aware of. And then last but completely not least is bias. And a lot of times when we talk about bias, we think about gender bias or racial bias. And while those can play a role in this bias, what I'm talking about is bias between one employee and another employee. So let's just throw out a completely fake policy for right now. And let's say everyone in your organization adopted a policy that said anyone who wants to go on vacation has to give at least seven days notice. Okay, seven days notice, no problem. But, you know, the friend of the manager comes to the manager and says, I forgot I have a wedding for my brother in three days. I just didn't put in for it. And the manager says, no problem. Go to the wedding, you know, have fun, toast them for me. Well, that's a problem because in doing so, they have created a difference between employee A who's following the policy and employee B who has been given special permission to avoid the policy. And now if there was an employment law issue at the organizational level, that employee A has a reason to say, well, that employee B had preferential treatment. They didn't follow the policies and I did. Or the policy didn't really mean anything because nobody followed the policy. And so before you put any policy into place at your organization, you want to be consistent. And this is such an important point. I'm going to bring it up again later. No policies unless you plan to see it through. Okay, now I'll get off my soapbox and we'll actually be here to talk about what you all are here to learn about. Uh, for those of you who came in late, I do want to reiterate, I love to take questions in the middle. If you have questions as you go, please drop them in the chat or come off mute. I will see you and just ask your question. Uh, okay, so we've gotten off my the hill that I'm willing to die on, and we've all decided we do want a policy for BYOD. What are the reasons we would want specifically a bring your own device policy? So here we're gonna be balancing security and privacy. So what are the risks to an employer that the employer is solving for? Uh, here we're looking at uh, not exposing client confidential information or any organizational confidential information. Accidental exposure can come in a lot of different forms. It is so uh, obvious and ubiquitous for people to think about hackers or you know, uh, somebody, a stranger looking on somebody else's device, but accidental exposure can happen in the home. If you have the photos of a domestic violence victim on your phone because you're getting ready for a trial tomorrow or uh, an injunction case tomorrow, and your phone or your child, friend, spouse, partner is flipping through your phone looking for photos of your last vacation, you could have just exposed client confidential information to somebody who has no business seeing those photos. And so accidental exposure of confidential data uh, is something that is really, that people should really think about when it comes to BYOD. Uh, the next one to think about is hacking and malware attacks. Uh, people treat their personal devices differently than they treat their devices that are handed to them by their employer. They just do. And so being aware that you're not going to have an IT support person or anyone else who's keeping track of what's going on with that device uh, or second guessing whether there's not any of the traffic coming from that device is safe. 
is something the employer needs to be aware of if you allow the incorporation of BYOD policy or employees to use their own devices. And then also you have to worry about stolen devices and public Wi-Fi. And those two both go down to whether or not someone is uh, someone nefarious is accessing information from that device uh, because it was left in a car, because it was left open and unlocked at a coffee shop, any number of opportunities at that point. So let's take a different approach and think about what does privacy or what is the problem with it for employees? So I, here we're looking at privacy infringement. I, a small detour where I say that some of these apply whether you're giving out employee or employer devices or BYOD devices, but we'll keep track of that as we go. So tracking user location. I am right now on my CLS issued device, my CLS issued laptop. If I had a CLS is issued phone and they were tracking my location, that is something they should probably tell me before they give me that device. The same thing goes for a BYOD device. If you are adding things to the devices to make it easier for the IT infrastructure to track them, uh, which means location sharing, it means browser history, it means app usage, or uh, really if you're looking at anything that is on the employer or employee's personal device, that needs to be included in your BYOD policy uh, because everyone should be fully aware of what they're committing to when they agree to this policy. Uh, another privacy infringement is so let's say an employee leaves the firm. They're retiring, they're quitting. How do you get what's on their device back into the organization? How do you know what's in their device when they leave? Now, many of you probably work at law firms. And, and by law firms, I mean law firms or nonprofit law firms. And so I can hear you. You say, Ellie, but the people who leave are lawyers and they're duty bound by their uh, professional responsibility to not disclose client confidential information. Cool, cool. You're right. Except that there are a lot of people in your organization who don't have the same professional responsibility obligations. You can usually hang a lawyer's bar card over their head and say, thou shalt not do the wrong thing because you could lose your license. But there are a bunch of people at your firm that probably don't have that same uh, rigor of rigorous obligation or stick if you needed to pull it out. And so being mindful of who has access to that kind of information and what data they're putting on their phone really does matter when a client or when an employee exits the firm. So we talked about employees quitting or retiring. We're going to assume that when employees quit or retire, they are largely leaving on good terms. What happens when an employee is leaving and it's not good terms. This employee's been fired and they've been fired for cause, they've been fired for any number of reasons. How do you ensure that what they have on their phone gets deleted or destroyed or gotten back by IT if required? How do you ensure that they, that at least, even if it doesn't come back to the firm, how do you ensure that it gets uploaded into the case file? Those are all of the challenges that you're going to face if you agree to implement a BYOD policy or that you're trying to um, solve for with a BYOD policy. So we've gotten this far, you're still interested. You're like, look, my employees are using their devices whether we tell them to or not. I get it. In that case, here are some uh, terms you may wanna put in a BYOD policy that are best practices for the employee requiring strong passwords, requiring encryption. Uh, this is something for the employer where they provide training on different uh, cyber threats. So at CLS, we have a monthly training on cyber threats every month. It can be on phishing, it can be on cyber attacks. And I truly believe that if you're training people in one area of their life, so if you're training them at work, this does percolate through to their private life because they may just take that extra moment to think, should I click that link? Is this text message real? Those kinds of things, which is what you want them to be doing you know, all the time because it makes us all safer to begin with. 
Uh, you also want to consider whether you should limit the types of data or the amount of data an employee is allowed to have on their phone. Are they allowed to have photos? Are they allowed to have case files? What about pleadings? These kinds of things you want to talk about. So here's a fun thing. I want you all to think about your organization for a second. Okay. Let's pretend you're all nonprofit law firms, which many of you probably are. And if you have a communications department, and if your communications department uses social media, so you guys post on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, any of those, does that person have a company issued phone? If they do not, there's a very high probability that they're taking their photos of outreach events, of pro bono clinics, of anything that they attend for the employees on their personal device and uploading them to social media. Many social media companies require cell phones and personal accounts to be attached to com commercial accounts. And so even if they're not, uh, even if you've issued them a company phone, they may have their personal account attached to that account. And so you need to know what information is going from one uh, account to the other. If they don't have, if they haven't been issued company devices, then the images that they're taking on their phone are things that you want to be aware of. Again, I can hear you thinking, Ellie, that's not client confidential information. We don't care about that. Great. If you don't care about it, you don't care about it. However, if you like to promote your organization and do reports at the end of the year for your funders or board members to say, look at all these beautiful events that we attended. Look at all these awesome outreach things we did where people came and received legal information. That content is stuff that you will need. Those photos taken at those events are the proprietary or are owned by the organization and therefore you need to be aware of them if they're living on private devices. I, and then again, talk about if there's any consent for monitoring. I'm gonna pause here and give anybody a chance, any questions so far? Okay, hearing none, we keep going. So how do we limit client or company liability? when it comes to BYOD policies. I, I promised you that we were gonna talk about it again, and here we are. If you implement a, a BYOD policy, you are going to implement it and then you're going to commit to it. So whatever that means. I, I will tell you that I do not think there's a single organization I've ever worked for where employees were not also using their personal devices for work. And so while this conversation about BYOD policies does paint it as optional, and it is, the reality is most people are using their devices anyway. And so to not at least think through what that looks like for your organization and what the best practices should be for your organization is tantamount to putting your head in the sand. I, a lot of times with BOIOD policies, um, companies limit their liability by requiring employees to indemnify them if company data is exposed through their device. I, that may seem draconian, but I think it depends very much on what the company's uh, risk tolerance is and whether or not they're willing to assume the responsibility if something goes awry with that uh, individual's devices. So in preparing for this presentation, I thought, okay, so what are the benefits of BYODs? Uh, so everyone's pretty much using their cell phones anyway. Why, why put a policy like this in place anyway? Why should we encourage that kind of behavior? And so these are some of the ones that I came up with I, or that the internet came up with. It increases customer satisfaction. And I can personally attest anecdotally that having teams on my phone does make it easier for me to interact with people if I'm moving around the office. I am no longer constrained to the notifications I get on my phone or emails that come to me. If I am in flight, I can respond to something in flight. 
And one of my personal rules is like, don't keep people from working. And so if somebody is blocked because they've sent me an email and they're waiting for me to reply, if I can take five seconds to respond via email, just saying like, go for it, then that is a, a benefit to the organization because it's one person who can continue doing what they were doing without having to context switch to another um, task. It does reduce cost. So I, a lot of people say, how does it reduce cost? Well, you could alternatively buy a cell phone for everyone in your organization and ask them to carry it around with them and use only their, that company issued cell phone which would increase your overhead costs in terms of hardware. It would increase your IT infrastructure costs in terms of management and service. It, of course, over, then you have to have data plans for each of these phones. So there are a lot of costs to doing this all in-house by allowing the employee to assume that cost and that risk, or uh, that is something that the employer is saving money on. And then you do have the ability to um, decrease duplicate work. If someone is sitting on their couch at night watching Law and Order and they have just like a brilliant idea, rather than having to write it down on a scrap of paper and then try to remember it the next day, they could immediately go into their notes uh, for that file or put it somewhere that they would remember when they resume work in the morning. So there are really two types of BY, well, three types if you want to count not having a plan at all. But there are two types of BYOD plans, uh, required and opt-in. So a required BYOD policy is like any other global policy you put in the organization that says, you know, thou shalt do this if you are employed with this organization. And uh, those can be really good for certain kinds of policies because they apply to everyone equally. Everyone has to know about them. And, uh, but I don't feel like they're the best practice for BYODs. And this is my personal opinion and intelligent minds can disagree. For me, I think that opt-in policies are the best option for BYOD policies. And I'll tell you why. So the benefits of, a B, of an opt-in policy is that gives you the opportunity to put the policy in front of an employee and say, rather than this just applying to every single person at the organization, I need you to read this and agree to it if you want to be able to use your personal device. And, and so in doing so, it's not just one policy in the you know booklet of policies that you hand them during onboarding. It's something that the organization has to, or the employee has to opt into. It also gives a sense of autonomy because the, the, organ the employee is saying affirmatively, I want this, I wanna be a part of this. It reduces IT oversight. So I, rather than just, th the next two are kind of uh, in tandem. So it clearly identifies the number of employees that it applies to. So right now, our organization has like 130, 120 people in it. If somebody leaves the firm, there is no way for us to know whether or not they are using their personal devices. We just have to assume they are or assume they're not. By having everyone sign an opt-in policy, uh, which is the plan at CLS, I, which I plan on rolling out, so TBD. My next update can be on what that rollout process looked like. But the now we will have a way for the IT department to actually know, okay, 89 people a part of, that are a part of this organization have opted into the BYOD policy and they have agreed to these terms to be bound by. And so when someone is offboarding, now we can say, hey, do they have an opt-in BYOD policy? Yes, they do. Therefore, let's add these four steps to their offboarding, which means reminding them that they owe a duty to clients to not share confidential information, that if they have any CLS data, that they need to either delete it from their phone or upload it to the appropriate places on our network. And, and it allows you to build the infrastructure around how to keep um, that data mindful. And so in my opinion, I, I do recommend opt-in policies. So I have written, which, I didn't mean to click. I'm going to. I, 
I have written a BYOD opt-in policy, which I'm going to share with everyone in the chat. Well, I'm not because I can't figure out how to click it, but I will share it with you guys shortly because we've actually made record time through my presentation. Uh, this opt-in policy is still in draft form. It has not been approved by CLS. So, you know, all caveats and disclaimers apply. That said, I really, really welcome feedback from this group if there's anyone who feels that I have missed a clause or that there are things to be included in the BYOD policy that, that we haven't already talked about. The other thing is it may be a good jumping off point for your organization. If you're thinking about adding a BYOD policy uh, to consider using an opt-in policy and uh, you're welcome to use mine as a template. So as I mentioned, I, my name is Ellie Mattern. Please find me on LinkedIn. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and drop that uh, opt-in policy in the chat. And then I will open it up for questions and maybe we can just have conversation. I'd love to hear if any of your organizations have implemented a BYOD policy and what that looks like. So I'm gonna throw a poll in if I can get it to work and um, just to see how many have policies. Maybe I'm not. <laughs> That's okay. I was going to say, see if everybody's fallen asleep. Maybe. Totally possible. Hmm. All right. So in the chat, I am about to drop the opt-in policy. Let's try that again. For anyone who is available to do so, if you're not on your phone, could somebody just click that link and confirm that it is open? I tried to share it with anyone who has the link, but I just want to make sure that it works. It did open for me. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so well, I'm not getting the poll to work. So I would love to hear how many people have policies at their organizations or don't have policies or considering a policy and that's why you're here today. So just put, yes, we have a policy. No, we don't have a policy or maybe thinking or thinking about it. And while we're waiting for those, um, I have a question, Ellie. So one of the things that I was concerned about, um, you know, I had a, a little bit of experience in e-discovery and all that kind of stuff. So in your research, is there much concern in the community about um, personal in, information on personal phones and then that makes the personal phone discoverable? So... I haven't done any research on that. Um, I, especially because we're law firms, a lot of the information, a lot of the information that attorneys or paraprofessionals are going to house is going to be either client confidential or attorney work product. And so they can likely skirt the edge of that. And because of that, I wasn't looking into that. However, with public companies, uh, I would be, if it wasn't a law firm, I would be really concerned about whether or not something's discoverable. And also not just discoverable, but I would think about chain of custody. So if you have someone who is working after hours on their personal device and they find something or screenshot something, I, and then the employee, the attorney wants to get that in at court, then what does that look like? And I think depending on the way in which that is stored and depending on the way in which they can authenticate it, may make a difference uh, and it could be different in each state but that is something i've been thinking about is uh, evidence that's collected on a personal device where where does that live in the discourse of byod policies i see a couple of chats um doug says they don't have one 
yet, but they're working on it. It looks like a couple of people don't have them. Steve said, we have a mobile device use policy. However, it's not specifically written for BYOD and MAP has a BYOD policy that's written into their technology policy. Since we're talking about kind of, since Amanda brought up technology policies in general, I, we have quite a few other technology policies as well that are around uh, cyber risk or about traveling with company devices. And uh, right now we have them all separate and I will be instituting the opt-in BYOD policy. There is a question um, from my perspective as to whether or not it would make more sense to consolidate them all into one technology policy. But I, I think I haven't made that executive decision yet. But I can see, Amanda, why you may want to wrap a BYOD into a larger technology conversation and policy. I am, so Jason asks, is the BYOD policy the only opt-in policy we have? I am not sure. I don't, I can't think of any other opt-in policies. I, but I seem to recall one in the back of my mind. It's like scratching at the back of my mind. I, but I will, I, I'm not sure. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Amanda said, we have had luck with using Intune to have staff enroll personal devices so that they can at least ensure their devices are meeting some basic security policies. That's awesome. I'm going to save that. One of the things that we do plan on using, uh, we use a an inventory tracker for our IT issued devices. And so I plan on adding the opt-in policy to that uh, device tracker so that we can see under each individual employee, you know, what laptop they have, what monitors they have, and then also whether they've opted into the policy so that we're, we're tracking it somewhere in our inventory. And I am looking for our our technology policy I, that I have um, cleaned up a little bit, and I'll throw that in the chat here shortly. But I'd love to answer any get it, your questions answered. I mean, you came to the webinar today, so I'm guessing that you perhaps had questions. This is your chance to engage with Ellie and engage with other people in the community to get some answers. So please. Take advantage of this opportunity. Jason, I see you raised your hand. Um, I think you can come off mute on your own. If so, do go for it. Jason, we can't hear you, so I don't know if your mic's not working. While you figure that out, Mary, I see your question about the percentage of staff using our BYOD. So I've just put the BYOD policy recently together by and done all the research on it. And so I'll be taking it to the executive team and rolling it out through the rest of the year. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go for it, Jason. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're... Um, we haven't set out our, um, you know, we have a pretty good draft of our BYOD policy. Um, uh, you know, the one thing I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with um, at the time is, yeah, cell phones. Um, we, you know, we have roughly 160 um, employees and that's a lot of cell phones to issue out um, for, uh, you know, um, you know, to, to keep track of and stuff like that. I mean, is it the most secure uh, method? Yes. Um, there are, you know, 
even if we issue uh you know the cell phones to you know the people they're gonna they're gonna use their personal phone for business related <laughs> issues but i guess you know point taken you know as long as you have the policy and everybody understands that then you're you know you're um protecting their organization um but you know just curious to know your comments on you know what you've kind of came across and what you kind of resolved um you know i do like that opt in policy you know that i think that could be very useful in something like this um and the people that don't want to you know opt in um would then you know be required to have a issue you know, work issued cell phone um you know your points of you know taking pictures i didn't think about that as far as you know um updating them to you know you know a facebook account and now that's that's something that we would have to have records of <laughs> so um just curious to know how you tackle that and so, what things you thought about as far as you know coming up with a policy so i've actually i thought of a couple of things so there are on on the realm of the spectrum there's like everybody uses their own device everybody uses an internal device and when you think about internal devices, I think, wow, that's super expensive. What does that look like from an organizational cost perspective? And then also resource management perspective on the IT infrastructure of managing. So for me, what I have thought through is, okay, so who really needs a cell phone that's company issued? And what does that look like? And so at CLS, we are going to roll out the opt-in BYOD policy for people to use their personal devices. We have two... Yeah, two company issued cell phones um, for members of the executive team that needed them for work reasons. But, and this is this is what I impart to you, Jason. I had an idea um, recently was that not all cell phones need to get calls. And so what we did for our communications department was I asked the IT department and I asked the comms department, hey, does anybody have an old phone that you're not using anyway? And it turned out that um, somebody did. And so we wiped the phone. It's not connected from any kind of uh, phone service. And I told the, I, the, and we delegated it to the communications department and said, this is the phone you will take photos on for CLS. And it will be, a, it's a company issued phone now, but it doesn't have cell phone service. And so it didn't cost us as much because A, it was donated to the organization for free. It also, we don't have to pay maintenance in terms of uh, every month cell phone issuing. However, now that device is owned by the organization. If they were to leave the organization, we say we need that phone back. And so that was something I had thought maybe a way to resolve people who want to have a company issued phone but maybe we don't have uh, enough money to issue everyone a phone. Now it could be an IT nightmare to have a bunch of different phones, but since they're not, uh, as long as they're not too old and as long as you're making sure that people are updating them periodically uh, as a part of the IT infrastructure anyway, you could do a phone drive through your organization and say, hey, if you've got a phone sitting in your drawer that's not working, that may be the phone you had before the cell phone you're using now, donate it donate it to our organization and our IT department's going to use those as company issued devices. That is, a, that's an idea I came up with. I don't know if it helps at all, but that's uh, one thing to consider. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that, that is a good idea. We do have, you know, um, office, uh, you know, cell phones that, you know, can, you know, people can use and, um, that's before I think um, really people, you know, before they really became, you know, uh, remote and mobile. Um, but now you have, you know, just just everyone's just so you know mobile. <laughs> so so um, you know, and people are calling on clients. They need to call clients. Um, and I guess you know, it's you know, there's so many. Th factors you got to consider i guess is yeah you know who what are they doing with their phones what types of services are they texting clients i hope not 
um, you know, <laughs> you know, it's it's that that type of uh, thing you really you really need to think about. Um, you know, we're 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 looking at um, you know upgrading our phone system, um, and you know, as a you know, get in a mobile app, on, you know, we could put those on people's devices and so they'd be calling. Um, and so we'll still have a record of that within the cloud. Um, but, you know, and then the, the texting would be handled through the, um, you know, through the telephone provider as well. Um, and that wouldn't be directly on the phone, it would be within the cloud or in the cloud. So those are some things that we've been thinking about to, Try to figure out, you know, not to, or, or to alleviate the, you know, issuing work cell phones, that, you know, to, you know, the attorneys. So, um, you know, those are, you know, some things I'm thinking about. And but it, like I said, it comes sometimes down to, you know, who really needs them, um, and if, but also keeping within the security policy of that of, of what what the organization develops um but it, it is a lot a lot of a lot of moving parts definitely and there were a couple of points in there that i you know that client communication you know you have to have a policy on client communication and any any communication documenting in your case management system you know so all of these things tie together um it's really important to make sure that your your employees understand that there has to be that documentation. So you may allow them to use their own devices, but things need to get put into the case management. Um, Paul, I know your hand had been up. Did your question get answered? In a roundabout way, yes. Uh, I was really just curious as to why there might be a need to do a allowing staff to bring their own device. I mean, is it a financial sharing of the of the burden? Because I know providing equipment to a nonprofit organization can be expensive. So are you trying to share that cost with the staff or is it more of a convenience factor that that's their personal preference? Because I'm, I'm coming at it from both sides. I'm looking at it from the business side, from a financial cost looking at it from the IT side, from a management stocks cost, and also the e-discovery background as well. I spent six years doing e-discovery projects as well. And having to go to a, 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 a partner's house to do a, an e-discovery document collection because he had forwarded emails to his home computer. So mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, it's messy. And I'm just trying to figure out what's the, I think if I better understood the motivation or the desire for what, is driving th this request for a bringing your own device might help better formulate our response. And I was just curious just what other people, what's the purpose that you're trying to accomplish by allowing it? I totally welcome this question to the group, but I will answer from my perspective. So I joined Community Legal Services a year and a half ago, and there are a attorneys at the firm who are using their personal computers and always have been. Um, and every el everyone else is using a, and those attorneys don't want to move off of their personal device. Uh, and almost every person in the firm is using their cell phone in some capacity. So at our organization, it is already pervasive that people are using their devices. So it is about how do we mitigate risk of something we know the employees already plan on doing, they are doing and they want to do. And how do we um, secure that as much as possible? I think if you were to come into an organization that had no employees, you were starting the organization up and you had the IT infrastructure to say, hey, we're gonna issue everyone their own devices, everyone's gonna use it from the beginning and everyone's really excited to keep their work life with work and their home life with home and they're never gonna mix the two then there's no reason to have a BYOD policy except to say that at our organization, we don't use our own devices. And that is a totally acceptable BYOD policy. We only use company issued devices. Um, so I think some of it is about knowing where your organization is and how their employees want to work. Yeah, and that's, I understand it entirely. I mean, it's 
kind of the genie's out of the bottle. You can't put it back in there. <laughs> For several people, have really already grown accustomed, and they've got their own personal device, which in some cases may be of a higher quality or higher capability than the ones that I'm going to provide them. Uh, we, we try to provide people with, with new quality equipment, but uh, we don't do cell phones. That's just a decision that was made years ago. So everybody's using their personal cell phone. And yeah, we've given them a voice over IP app that they can install. So now you've extended the organization's needs to a personal device. And then so at that point, I mean, like I said, the, the genie's out of the bottle. I was just trying to better understand. That'll help That's formulate right. what's the right what's the right spot. Um, I don't think we're going to shut it down and start over though. So I got to figure out a way to make it work. Um, I, I did see Adrian or Adrian uh, asked a question. She, she or he, I don't know. If you have a corporate dev and it gets confiscated or a corporate device and it gets confiscated due to being used as evidence in a legal or regulatory matter, that is not a bit a big deal, what are the implications of the BYOD? I assume that was big deal. Um, if you're gonna get the device back, it's not a big deal. I guess there's a question there. I don't ever wanna see a device of mine out. I don't wanna see the device of mine to someone else and allow them to do whatever they want with it because that to me is a breach of client confidentiality. Um, I have in probably two or three years ago when there were all of those stories about TSA asking to take someone's phone or laptop into a private room and do we don't know what with, um, I had often wondered what would happen if they came up against a lawyer who refused to give over their device based on client confidential information. Um, or even somebody who has trade secrets on their device. I think a lot of that hasn't been litigated, but I think you'd see a lot of people go to bat for the, or get the bars involved to go to bat for why that device should not be ceded to that regulatory organization. Um, if I've misunderstood your question, please, I see you came off mute, so. No, I have never encountered it before. I know that it is a possibility. And so, you know, that's a huge reason for me not to use a personal device for corporate use, because now you're without your phone and everything on it. Plus, like you said, there could be potentially other private data that shouldn't be viewed. So I was just wondering if there were, you know, situations that you were aware of where something like that happened. I haven't. I've seen it and I've been watching for it. I just have it. I don't think it's been tested in court really yet. Or if it has, I welcome any of you to share court cases with me. I'm, I'm really fascinated by what the implications of those of that is, um, right. but I haven't seen it yet. Thank you. Also a great question. So going back to Paul's question a little bit, I think there's also when um, when attorneys work with, say, rural clients who work in agriculture, or things like that, many of those clients use um, WhatsApp. So having WhatsApp on company um, computers sometimes can be problematic due to policies. So it can or if they're going out in the field. You know, it's very convenient for the attorney to use that app on their phone because they're out in the field, may not have access to, say, their laptop. Um, so there, there can be many reasons why use of a personal device for work. Um, you know, I, I think convenience, I think for all of us, you know, it's very nice to be able to roll over, look at my calendar and know whether I can be in workout clothes all day or, if, you know, if I need to, if I need to be a little uh, more professional that day. So um, I think that's where we, a lot of people just use for the convenience of it. Yeah, I think it does come down to convenience. I, I think one other thing I'll say, Adrian, and I'm not sure that I'm saying your name right. <laughs> Please feel free to correct me is while we're talking about BYOD policies today, the first policy that I implemented completely at CLS was a travel and technology policy. 
And uh, we have basically said as an organization, you can go anywhere in the US that you want, any in the US is fine. I, and you can have your devices with you. You may not travel out of the country with a CLS issued device and you cannot travel with any of your CLS issued like connected apps while abroad either. Right. If you, um, and that's, you know, we don't wanna be the one to test that TSA case. Well, no, and not only that, there's a lot of different regulations in different countries, which then you may not be properly following. That, and and I also, uh, so the conversation was had at our organization about can people work remotely from these other countries? And especially, I, I understand that um, impetus, especially when you see so many people as digital nomads on your, while scrolling, you're like, doesn't that seem lovely? The problem is that I said, you know who doesn't want the responsibility of deciding which nation states are safe to take a laptop to and which ones aren't? This gal. So since it's not going to be my job to decide, yes, you can go to this country, but no, you can't go to this country because that one's not cyber safe. And, and also keeping that up to date uh, because it could change moment to moment uh, or at least week to week. And I could have approved someone going with a device two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden there's a really big problem and they can't take their device to that state. And so because of that, um, you're right. We also don't want any of the regulatory risk about, um, so Singapore doesn't actually allow Airbnbs. It's illegal, even though there are some that you can rent. Well, somebody rented an Airbnb in Singapore, and then that turned out to be someplace that, or at least they couldn't last time I checked when I was actually visiting. And if somebody rented an Airbnb and then regulatory bodies broke into that place and said, hey, you're not allowed to be here and confiscated the device, what recourse do we have? And just because we don't want to deal with any of that risk, we, I, I told everyone, you want to go to Puerto Rico, you want to go to Guam, you're great. Anywhere else outside of the U.S. or like anywhere that's not a U.S. territory or a U.S. state can't go there with our stuff. Right. All right. So that's two policies for a price of one. Well, if we don't have any questions, I certainly don't want to take up more of our afternoon, but this is your chance. We still have a few minutes on, on the schedule. So if you have a question, please. Let us know. If anybody else has implemented a BYOD policy, I would love for you to, I'll drop my email in the chat. If you don't mind sharing, I would love to see yours so that I can compare it to mine and see what provisions I may have forgotten or should include or maybe reword. That would be stupendous. Uh, Shelly, if if it doesn't look like we've got too many questions, maybe we can stop recording and then just hang out a little bit afterward in case anybody wants to ask another question. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and end the recording by doing my sum up, and then we'll turn off the recording. And if people have questions, sounds like a good plan. So thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate everyone stopping by and I hope that this session has been helpful. We always are looking for ideas on what kind of sessions would be helpful for you. So please give us feedback and let us know. And thank you so much.